Hi, ActiveHistory.ca is pleased to present a recording of Pride and Prejudice, Anti-Americanism Among Canada's Intellectuals, 1891 to 1945. This talk was delivered by Damien Claude Belanger of the University of Ottawa as part of the Ottawa Historical Association Lecture Series. You can find recordings of other talks at ActiveHistory.ca. The average Canadian attitude towards the United States and all things American cannot permanently be based upon pride and prejudice, or to use a word, ignorance, warned Douglas Bush in uh, 1929. The Ontario-born literary scholar uh, was no doubt exaggerating when he spoke about the, the scope and depth of anti-American sentiment in Canada, uh, but he was well aware of the tradition of anti-Americanism among Canada's elites, and most notably among Canadian intellectuals. And indeed, though uh, Canada's intellectual culture has changed quite fundamentally uh, since Confederation, anti-American sentiment continues to play a role even today in uh, Canadian thought. Uh, Now, this apparent shift, uh, or this apparent continuity masks a shift in uh, the underpinnings of anti-American rhetoric in Canada. Uh, anti-American rhetoric was, uh, is, is closely associated today with a left-wing thought, but has traditionally in Canada, in fact, been much more associated uh, with the right-wing, and it was largely a right-wing doctrine in Canada, or conservative doctrine, before the 1960s. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, uh, anti-Americanism among uh, Canada's conservative intellectuals. Um, The shift that occurs between uh, right-wing and uh, left-wing anti-Americanism occurs uh, during the Cold War, in fact, Um, in part because America begins to project a different image to the intellectuals, not just of Canada, but of the Western world during the Cold War. Uh, But before the Cold War, the United States was widely regarded as a nation that had embarked on a number of progressive experiments, including the New Deal, and was often perceived as a nation that rejected militarism. So the vision that the United States, uh, the vision that many intellectuals in Canada and elsewhere had of the United States was very different uh, before 1945. Now, American actions have historically intensified or lessened uh, anti-American sentiment in Canada and elsewhere. Uh, especially among the masses. But the American actions have never really been causal, uh, in my opinion, to elite anti-Americanism, at least in Canada. So what really lies behind anti-American sentiment? Now, previous scholarship has generally uh, uh, tended to view anti-American sentiment merely as an expression of Canadian nationalism. Um, But I would argue instead that it firstly reflected the intellectual's reading of modernity. Uh, And indeed, in early uh, Canadian discourse, America embodied both the promise and the dangers of the mass age. And conservative anxieties regarding uh, modernity found often a convenient outlet in anti-American rhetoric. Um, This conference is going to examine the relationship between anti-American rhetoric and modernity in both English and uh, French-speaking Canada and in English and French-speaking intellectual discourse. Um, The period under study begins in 1891. It ends in 1945, and this is a time when the Dominion experiences accelerated urbanization, accelerated industrialization, massive industrialization indeed, uh, technological change, and the rise of mass culture. Um, And to many of Canada's intellectuals, these changes uh, found their source and often also their embodiment in the United States. Um, 1891, you might ask why I chose that to begin uh, my study, Uh, 1891 is a very important year, to my mind, in the intellectual history of Canada. Uh, One of Canada's 
most bitterly fought elections uh, occurred in that year, and it was an election centered on the issue of reciprocity and ultimately centered on the issue of what Canada's relationship with the United States should be. 1891 was also the year when Goldwyn Smith published Canada and the Canadian Question, which to my mind is one of the most important, if not the most important Canadian essays of the 19th century. Uh, And in it, uh, Smith argued that the Dominion was a geographic, a political, and an ethnic absurdity, and that Canada's ultimate destiny lay in, uh, in annexation to the United States. Uh, the book caused a tremendous controversy, um, and people were still answering Smith and his arguments uh, 50 or 60 years after the book was published. Um, By and large, the period that we're going to examine today encompassed the respective uh, zeniths or summits of English-Canadian imperialism and also of traditional French-Canadian nationalism. Uh, In pre-war English Canada, anti-American sentiment reaches its peak during the golden age of imperialism, roughly from the 1890s to uh, the World War I era. Uh, And then anti-American sentiment is going to begin to ebb uh, during the interwar years as a new generation of progressive intellectuals is going to embrace America and, uh, well, continentalism at the very least, and also modernity. Um, In French-speaking Canada, the process was somewhat different. We're going to see a lot of the themes overlap, but the way in which anti-American sentiment expressed itself in the time at which it expressed itself was different in English and French-speaking Canada. And uh, in French Canada, the process was somewhat different. The anti-American sentiment that had... um, that had dominated the pre-World War I generation of intellectuals. It gets renewed and reinforced in the 1920s and 1930s as a new generation of nationalists led by Father Yannet Grou are going to stiffen the resistance to modernity and to America that had characterized their uh, predecessors. Um, the, The research that this talk is based on rests on a reading of about a corpus of about 300 uh, texts written by conservative Canadian intellectuals between 1891 and 1945. Um, Each text was selected for inclusion into the corpus because it examines some aspect of American life or some aspect of Canada's relationship with the United States. Um, the, The studies corpus was intended to be a comprehensive, not exhaustive, Um, and it's mostly made up of articles gleaned from various uh, journals of the era, for instance, the Queen's Quarterly or the University Magazine or L'Action Française. Um, On the whole, uh, the conservative thinkers that I examined in this study were essentially cultural figures. Uh, Most intellectuals in late 19th and early 20th century Canada were drawn from the uh, academic community, um, journalism, or from the ranks of the clergy. But these were essentially cultural figures who became involved in social and political debate without directly entering, generally, the field of partisan politics. Maybe Henri Bourassa is the exception here, but we'll we'll just have one exception. The point of Benoit, because he's working on Henri Bourassa. Um, In a a recent, or fairly recent, essay uh, called L'Obsession Anti-Américaine, Jean-François Revel, a French writer, uh, insists, quote, il il faut distinguer entre l'anti-américanisme et la critique des États-Unis. You have to distinguish between anti-Americanism and a critique of the United States. Uh, For instance, you know, criticizing you know, the American president or some policy in particular, that's not anti-Americanism, okay? And it's an important distinction because anti-Americanism has historically implied a systematic hostility to American civilization or a systematic critique of American civilization. Not merely a punctual critique, 
of some American policy or another. Okay, it has to be, it has to come from a place where one feels that there is something profoundly wrong about America. Okay. Uh, about American civilization, about the roots of American society. Um, by and large, uh, anti-American thinkers in Canada were also opposed, so they were, uh, they had a disfavorable opinion of American society, but also anti-American thinkers were opposed to continental integration. That's an important part of the equation. And they're also opposed to the idea um, that Canada was first and foremost, as journalist John Defoe put it, an American nation. So Canada has to be, you know, first and foremost, something else, you know, a British nation or, you know, uh, you know a Catholic society, a Christian society, but not first and foremost American in the wider continental sense. Um, now, it should be noted that the anti-American ethos was, was neither uniformly unsympathetic, nor was it wholly uninformed. Uh, certainly, it was not entirely the product of bitterness and traditional animosity. Uh, prominent anti-American thinkers could, on occasion, uh, wax sentimental about things like Anglo-Saxon unity or about the need for Canada to play some sort of linchpin role within the Anglo-American relationship. Uh, Anti-Americanism in Canada and elsewhere, but especially in Canada, was fundamentally different from several of the other great, what you could call uh, major negative faiths, like, for instance, anti-communism or anti-Semitism, because it lacked their unconditional nature. Uh, Canadian hostility to the United States generally, and this is still true today, tended to dissolve when it came into contact with the individual American. And so anti-American sentiment did not ultimately stop many Canadian intellectuals from uh, studying in the United States, adopting American practices, contributing to American periodicals, or vacationing in the United States, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, as I say, and this isn't only true in Canada, there's a great difference between, say, anti-Semitism and anti-Americanism. You rarely hear of anti-Semitic authors who go to study in Israel or have a Jewish wife and so on and so forth. But with anti-Americanism, it's not so cut and dry, especially in Canada, because, as I hope to show, it's not so much the United States that one rejects, it's this idea of a modern society. Um, now, anti-Americanism also is not an ideology. Uh, it's a series of ideas that are woven into a wider system of beliefs. And in Canada, before 1945, indeed before the 1960s, these, ideal, these ideas were integral to the conservative ethos. Uh, Anti-Americanism was expressed most fully in the discourse of the nation's two dominant conservative uh, families, and those being English-Canadian imperialism and French-Canadian nationalism. Uh, certainly, anti-Americanism has historically made for, for strange bedfellows. You just have to think today of the sort of strange coalitions that often come together to hate on the United States. This is not new. Uh, but more to the point, uh, French-Canadian nationalism and English-Canadian imperialism they're not necessarily antithetical ideologies. Uh, I'll talk about this further, but though they were often in opposition in terms of their vision of Canada, when you begin to examine their core ideals, they often resemble each other. Um, and indeed, the nationalists and the imperialists shared a number of overarching conservative values. We were talking about Karl Berger earlier, and Karl Berger always emphasized about how the imperialists were indeed nationalists. And they were. But they were also profoundly conservative. And I, I'd like to emphasize that. And the nationalists of Quebec were also profoundly conservative. And they both shared a number of overarching conservative values. And these included a firm belief in communitarianism and elitism, an appreciation of organic evolutionary change, a profound devotion to 
to tradition, a different tradition, but tradition nevertheless, a profound devotion also to continuity, to order, and to transcendence, and a deep conviction that freedom, order, and private property were intimately linked. Uh, That said, the English-Canadian critique of American society was both more fixated and more temperate than its French-Canadian counterpart. Um, English-speaking Canadians uh, tended to write much more about the United States. They tended to be more obsessed with the Canadian-American relationship, but they tended at the same time to be perhaps more temperate in their judgment of the United States. Uh, This apparent paradox uh, was the result of two basic factors. English Canada's more moderate conservative intellectual tradition and the fact that English Canada has an ethnocultural proximity to its southern neighbor that has historically made the United States the main focus of its efforts at survival. Unlike in French Canada, where the efforts at survival were typically aimed, in fact, at English-speaking Canada. Um, The English-Canadian critique of American civilization was also essentially political in nature, or primarily, should I say, political in nature, while the French-Canadian critique was essentially social and cultural, and we'll talk about uh, why that was. Um, It's been written that anti-Americanism is a disease of the intellectuals, Um, and I would argue that in the context of pre-1945 Canadian thought, anti-American rhetoric was in fact the symptom of a far deeper uh, affliction, which was anti-modernism. Modernity renews the intellectual's function, and yet most turn of the 20th century uh, Canadian thinkers were resolutely anti-modern. And Canadian anti-modernism found one of its principal outlets in anti-American rhetoric. But you might ask, why lash out at the United States? Because America, like the former Soviet Union, is, is in many ways more than a nation. Historically, it's embodied both a way of life and an ideological system that has pretensions to universality. Okay? The American way of life has you know, pretensions towards you know, being worldly. It's for everyone, ostensibly. Uh, the American Republic is also built on specific conceptions of liberty, of equality, of individualism, of secularism, which are certainly contested within the United States, but that to many writers, especially in Canada, have come to... uh, have come to epitomize a specifically liberal, if you will, small l liberal, uh, version of modernity. Uh, Moreover, the United States was very quick to embrace the mass age and its social and cultural and technological transformations. Thus, the pre-1945 critique of the United States was centered on a rejection, for instance, of republicanism of egalitarianism, of individualism, of secularism, a rejection also of mass culture and materialism, and to some extent also a rejection of industrialism or large-scale industrialism. Um, Now, undoubtedly, modernity's multiple dimensions make it a difficult uh, concept to grasp. Uh, According to historian Philip Masselin, it all boils down to, and I quote, the replacement of Victorian society, agrarian, religious, adhering to a rigid set of philosophical and moral codes, with the modern age, industrial, secular, and anti-philosophical. From an economic standpoint, he continues, it pertained to the arrival of an urban and industrial society that replaced an agrarian merchant system, Closely related to the process of urban industrialization, modernization also involved the rise of a consumer, scientific materialist, and technological society. So in essence, it's the replacement of a traditional society based on traditional values and traditional modes of production with a modern society. Um, Now, 
In many ways, anti-American rhetoric was tied to a wider denunciation of the status revolution that followed the rise of modernity. Um, the rapid economic transformations that accompanied industrialization profoundly affected Canada's social structure. They affect the social structure of many Western nations. Um, and as pre-modern status and deference was eroded, new social groups assumed some of the power and prestige that traditional elites had wielded. And intellectual concerns regarding the ill effects of the status revolution, they're tied to more general middle class concerns that invariably follow rapid social change. We're also living through a period of rapid social change today, and so there are some echoes, I think, of the period um, in this work. Um, now, Canadian intellectuals were aware that the United States was undergoing, and indeed many felt, exporting a status revolution. And conservative critics were appalled by its implications. In 1904, for instance, the editor of the Queen's Quarterly, James Kappen, lamented, quote, that the influence of the American businessman has been strong enough to set up success in making money as the popular test of a man's ability and worth, end quote. One of Quebec's leading conservative women writers, Ernestine pinot léveillé worried about the status of, if you will, refined French-Canadian women in the face of Americanization. In America, she warned the readers of the Revue Dominicaine in 1936, quote, La femme du monde n'est plus la femme d'un rang social élevé, d'une éducation soignée, d'une culture plus poussée. L'intérêt et l'argent ont tout nivelé avec quelques degrés dans l'égalité, suivant la capacité de réception et d'adaptation des uns et des autres. On est, plus, on est bien plus souvent qu'une femme riche ou simplement un membre anonyme, fallo, sans influence dans la société. End quote. Um, now, conservative writers were not only dismayed at the status granted in American society to millionaires, but also to sports stars and entertainers. Um, this is the era when you see the emergence, really, in the late 19th and early 20th century, of what you could call the superstar. Okay? It's the era of the emergence of mass culture. Um, like many interwar uh, French-Canadian nationalists, the dean of the University of Montreal's Faculty of Fo Philosophy, Father Cécile Forêt, he was horrified by the rise of the superstar and its implications for the status of the traditional elite. America's scale of values, he reasoned, was upside down. Now, this is a quote from uh, 1925. I believe. And he wrote, Quels sont ceux que les jeunes Américains connaissent, admirent et envient? Les littérateurs, les savants, les artistes? Nullement. Ce sont les étoiles de l'écran pour leur beauté, les étoiles du sport pour leur force ou leur adresse. Certains d'entre eux sont de véritables gloires nationales. Ils jouissent d'une célébrité qu'aucun homme public, qu'aucun savant, qu'aucun artiste n'oserait ambitionner. Leurs traits que les journaux ne se lassent pas de reproduire sont souvent plus familiers aux jeunes Américains que ceux du président des États-Unis. Lors du congrès eucharistique de Chicago, un journal reproduisit une photo où l'on voyait Babe Ruth donnant la main au cardinal Lega. Il n'est pas douteux que pour un grand nombre d'Américains, tout l'honneur était pour le Lega du Saint-Siège. Clergymen in particular Roman Catholic priests and Anglican ministers, were among the strongest exponents of anti-American sentiment in Canada. And indeed, rising secularism, which was frequently identified with the United States, often presented as an irreligious society, threatened their moral and intellectual leadership. Often I found that it's members of the clergy who felt most threatened by what some historians have called a status revolution in the United States and Canada. Um, now, for, for the intellectual right in early 20th century Canada, virtually every aspect of social and political debate, including issues related to gender, to identity, to the nature 
of democratic institutions. These could be discussed through the prism of the United States. It's remarkable. Sewage management, anything. Okay? You can look through the prism of American society at anything. Um, American society, indeed, seemed to, uh, seemed to offer an unsettling vision of the not-so-distant future to many Canadian writers. To many of Canada's conservative intellectuals, the core principles of the American experience reflected a fundamental imbalance, a lack of order, which affected almost every aspect they believed of American society. American materialism was denounced far more frequently by French Canadian intellectuals, principally because Catholicism played such a key role in the formulation of nationalist discourse in Quebec. Um, Le matériel accapare la portion la plus considérable de l'énergie américaine, warned the University of Montreal's professor of American literature, Hermas Bastien, in 1936. America, he continued, quote, was a civilisation d'essence économique that embodied le libéralisme à l'état pur, oublieu des personnes et des distinctions ethniques. Most uh, Canadian conservatives were reasonably critical also of American liberty. They valued liberty as a traditional right, but saw American freedom as a modern deviation from British tradition. Either liberty is always viewed as being out of balance in the United States. Either there's too much of it or not enough, depending on who's uh, writing. Um, and though Canadian uh, conservatives generally had little use for hereditary privilege, many viewed American egalitarianism as a radical attempt at class leveling. In 1910, the editor of the university magazine, Andrew McPhail, insisted that American notions of equality were a threat to, so to social order. Quote, a nation in which a man is a king and all men equal in power and glory, cannot organize e itself even for industrial purposes, he warned. Um, American political institutions were viewed as the antithesis of British tradition by most imperialists. Imperialists are by far the ones who write the most about American political institutions in Canada. Uh, these political institutions derive their legitimacy from the people rather than from God and the sovereign, and as a result, American politics and government were often perceived to be unstable, ineffective, and corrupt. Uh, French Canadian conservatives generally uh, generated relatively little comment on American politics and government, at least in the period that I'm looking at. In an earlier period, they write a little bit more about it. Um, and ultimately, the nature of political institutions mattered far less to intellectuals whose conception of what was often referred to as la race française en Amérique was essentially ethno-religious and uh, cultural. Cultural issues, they did, however, loom large in uh, nationalist commentary. Uh, in the United States, it was argued, culture had become commodified and it had become debased. America's intellectual elite had lost all of its cultural influence, and culture was designed to appeal to the lowest common denominator. American education, not surprisingly, was the object of a great deal of commentary. A lot of the people who are writing, a lot of intellectuals, are in fact educators. Um, and in the eyes of many of these educators, American schools and colleges embodied a new form of learning. American education was viewed as, you guessed it, secular, viewed as egalitarian, and also viewed as utilitarian. And this, of course, could only draw the ire of conservatives who held these values in very low regard. Imperialists and uh, French-Canadian nationalists agreed that education should not be regarded as a purely utilitarian endeavor, and that a classical education was the most suitable to forge intellectual and moral leaders. And indeed, that the whole goal of education was to form leaders. Um, 
Issues related to race and ethnicity also raised a fair amount of uh, criticism. Now, on this issue, many conservative intellectuals uh, faced a, an essential dilemma. How could they criticize America's mistreatment of its racial minorities without at the same time appealing for racial equality? Uh, most reached uh, resolve this quandary with a fair dose of paternalism, as we're going to see. Uh, for many conservatives, both the Republic's treatment of its uh, black population and African Americans themselves were viewed as blemishes on American society. Uh, and indeed, though segregation and racial violence were frequently denounced in conservative writing in Canada, um, Blacks were seldom treated as intellectual and moral equals. For instance, in 1902, uh, Father Antonio Uo, who had in fact lived in the United States uh, for quite some time, condemned, quote, les franchissables color line, comme on dit en ce pays, qui empêche les blancs et les noirs de voyager en chemin de fer, dans le même wagon, et de dîner au restaurant à la même table, dans les anciens états esclavagistes. Yet in the same breath, within a few sentences later, he noted, quote, that la race noire est une race inférieure, et il serait absolument chimérique de croire qu'il soit possible aux nègres, placés dans les mêmes conditions que le blanc, d'atteindre le niveau intellectuel de celui-ci. Uh, the impact of large-scale immigration on the United States was also viewed with alarm, especially in imperialist circles. Uh, by and large, imperialists believed that non-British immigration was rapidly weakening America's already diluted Anglo-Saxon stock. Many imperialists believed the United States was, in fact, no longer an Anglo-Saxon nation. Other people said it was, but it was on its way out. There was something of a debate. But in either instance, it was assumed that large-scale non-British immigration was a threat. Um, but immigrants were not only weakening the United States... Uh, from a racial standpoint, they were also viewed as dangerous agents of political corruption, industrial strife, and revolution. Uh, two immigrant groups were often singled out among Canadian writers as uh, the targets of widespread abuse when they write about the United States. Right? What, what do you think they were? Irish. The Irish and? Germans. No. Italians? No. Nope. Chinese? No. Nope. Getting close. <laughs> no. Jews. Okay. So there's there's a lot of writing on immigrants in general, but when you begin to break it down, the two groups that are often the targets of, of a lot of criticism are the Irish and Jewish immigrants. Uh, time and time again, imperialists linked Irish immigration to crime and to political corruption in uh, the United States. And indeed, the corrupt Irish American politician became a bit of a cliche in Canadian prose. Uh, American Jews were for their part often associated with revolution on the one hand and with materialism on uh, the other hand. Uh, Anti-American rhetoric also contained powerful gendered uh, messages. And indeed there was a definite correlation between anti-feminism in Canada and anti-Americanism. Uh, many Canadian conservatives were concerned by what they saw, or what they believed to see, as rising gender equality in the United States, which they believed was an affront to traditional conceptions of the complementarity of the sexes. To Andrew McPhail, as he put it, he wrote a whole article about this, the American woman uh, was insubordinate, sterile, vain, and idle, and her rebelliousness was quintessentially American. So I quote here from 1909, the United States began with an act of lawless, lawlessness and their conduct ever since has been marked by that spirit. Now this spirit of lawlessness has seized upon the women. It would be too large a matter to demonstrate how it has broken up the family life and disorganized the social relation, how it has instigated rebellion against the marriage tie and defeated the intent of all created beings that they should be fruitful and multiply, end quote. Uh, many uh, Canadian conservatives believed that modern notions of equality 
sexuality, and matrimony were dissolving the American family. The disintegration of the family unit in the United States was attributed to a number of causes, including uh, birth control, uh, irreligion, uh, and divorce. Uh, and indeed, denouncing the republic's divorce rate was a staple of anti-American rhetoric in Canada. Um, in 1893, the associate editor of the Toronto Daily Empire, John Castell Hopkins, deplored, as he put it, the looseness of the marriage tie in the Great Republic. Between 1867 and 1886, he continued, 200,000 divorces were granted in the United States as compared to 116 given in Canada. I have no doubt about these statistics, by the way. Right? Uh, that's 116, period, not 1,000. The trouble, of course, is caused largely by the difference in the laws of the various states which permit the anomalous and disgraceful condition of a man or a woman being married in one state and single in another, end quote. Um, since the 19th century, the United States has also been identified with a specific economic system, industrial capitalism. The pre-war right was usually quick to identify the United States with the evils of the machine age and the unregulated market. And indeed, though Canadian conservatives, like their European counterparts, were very much in favor of free enterprise, they regularly denounced, especially in Quebec, industrial giganticism and monopolistic capitalism. Um, conservatives, again, especially in Quebec, believed that large-scale industrialism bred disorder. It, ups, it upset pre-modern social relations, it destroyed the balance between rural and urban society, and it produced revolutionary dissatisfaction. Uh, for the anti-American, these factors blended with more traditional concerns regarding the violent nature of American society and its apparently defective system of justice. You often see this in Canadian writing, there's no justice in the United States. Either people get hanged for nothing or they don't get hanged, uh, but there's a sense there's no justice in the United States and that the society is crime-ridden. Um, in conservative commentary, violence and criminality were often viewed as intrinsic to the American experience. Some imperialists argued, in fact, that violence and lawlessness were the result or the legacy of the American Revolution. For instance, a leading figure in Ontario's United Empire Loyalist Movement, Colonel George T. Dennison, frequently argued that the Revolution had purged the early Republic of its most law-abiding citizens, the Loyalists, and had taught Americans to solve their problems through violence, that it was embedded into their political system from the very beginning. Um, now, anti-American sentiment, nationalism, and the politics of Canadian identity have long shared a deep intimacy. Uh, imperialists and French-Canadian nationalists were always eager to present their nation as fundamentally conservative, as also fundamentally anti, or at the very least, non-American. Unlike the United States, Canada was founded on the bedrock of tradition and of continuity. And as the self-proclaimed guardians of tradition, conservatives claimed ownership over the right to define what was and was not Canadian. Uh, Anti-Americanism was a key ingredient in the imperialist creation myth. And Canada's birth, indeed, could be traced to an anti-American saga, the Loyalist Expulsion. In their rejection of republicanism, the loyalists, it was believed, had given birth to a fundamentally ordered and conservative society. According to the imperialist narrative, the loyalists had founded a nation on the bedrock of continuity with Britain. A loyalist rhetoric did not merely assert Canada's conservative and non-American nature, it also contained insidious racial uh, and ethnic cues, which affirmed the preeminence, the social and political preeminence of British Canadians. And indeed, if Canada was a British nation, then British Canadians were its natural leaders. And indeed, 
outside of Quebec, it's not surprising to see that anti-American sentiment was strongest among the British-born or people of British and especially English ancestry. Um, Canada's distinctiveness and indeed Canada's superiority, because the two tend to go hand in hand, uh, lay in its essentially British and conservative nature. And the Canadian political system lay at the heart of imperialist differentialism. Constitutional monarchy and the imperial bond, it was argued, they bred order and deference. And Canada's political stability underpinned its moral order. Um, for their part, French Canadian nationalists saw Quebec and the United States as fundamentally antithetical uh, entities. For Father Adélard Zugré, who's writing here in 1925, the contrast between Quebec and the United States was evident. French Canadian society was, as he put it, simple, patriarchal, essentiellement catholique et conservatrice. While American society was éblouissante et tapageuse, protestante et matérialiste. Quebec, as the inheritor, or the apparent inheritor of pre-revolutionary France, was the embodiment of Catholic tradition, while America was the quintessence of both Protestantism and modernity. Um, but French-Canadian distinctiveness was not only based on Catholicism and the French language and culture. Many nationalists argued also that it was fundamentally racial. French-Canadian nationalists often argued that Americans were Anglo-Saxons and that French-Canadians as Latins were kind of their racial opposites. The two races, indeed, were believed to possess fundamentally different characteristics. As Jesuit Edmond, Edouard Hamon noted in 1891, quote, le caractère français est juste aux antipodes du caractère anglo-saxon américain. Autant l'un est gay, expansif, sans souci, compatissant avec les misères des autres, prêt aux sacrifices les plus généreux, autant l'autre est froid, concentré, calculateur et égoïste, end quote. Um, now, both imperialists and French-Canadian nationalists argued that Canadian distinctiveness was threatened by the United States. And indeed, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, many conservative intellectuals believed that continental integration or cultural convergence would result in the moral, <laughs> the spiritual, and the political extinction of the Canadian nation. Pre-World War imperialists were most undoubtedly the nation's most cautious observers when it came to the Canadian-American relationship. They hoped to see the Dominion maintain cordial relations with the United States without sacrificing Canadian independence or endangering imperial unity. Uh, continental integration, and in particular Canadian-American free trade, was more or less out of the question. Imperial trade, trade with Britain, nourished Canadian distinctiveness and tradition. Free trade with the United States would slowly poison both, it was argued. Um, the Dominion's progressive Americanization was a source of concern to imperialist intellectuals. It was, however, a major source of concern in Quebec. And this was particularly true during the interwar years in the 20s and 30s when French Canadian nationalists were alarmed by the rapid spread of American popular culture. Um, Americanization, it was argued, was a sly form of assimilation precisely because it relied on sim seemingly benign or, if you will, cultural means of propagation. But Americanization did not only rely on cultural means to propagate itself. Tourism, emigration to the United States, and in the American investment were frequently cited as vectors of Canadian-American convergence by Quebec's nationalist intellectuals. Uh, resistance to international unionism was also strongest in Quebec. The province's Roman Catholic clergy viewed American unions as dangerous agents of secularism and assimilation, and the clergy saw itself to some extent as being involved in a life and death struggle for the soul of Quebec's working class. And indeed, as the Catholic Church was concerned, issues related to labor and industry were indissociable 
from religion. And as a result, theological arguments often dominated nationalist criticism of international unionism. Henri Bourassa is going to sum up the nationalist position on American unions or international unions in a 1919 pamphlet. And he wrote, Le syndicalisme international est neutre et pernicieux en soi et dans tous les pays parce qu'il ne tient aucun compte dans la recherche des avantages qu'il propose à ses adhérents de Dieu, de la famille et de la patrie, ces trois assises fondamentales de l'ordre social chrétien. Le péril est incomparablement plus grand ici que partout ailleurs, à cause de l'unique voisinage des États-Unis. Le syndicalisme international veut dire au Canada le complet assujettissement des travailleurs canadiens aux caprices et à la domination du travail américain syndiqué. C'est l'une des manifestations les plus complètes et les plus prenantes de la conquête morale et économique du Canada par les États-Unis. End quote. Now, the rise of modernity invariably produces two basic sensibilities. And in Canada, before the 1940s and 50s, the essential dichotomy between modern and anti-modern thought was partially, uh, partially masked, if you will, by a debate over Canada's Americanness, over its Americanité, if you will. During the period under study, Canada was a transitional society, or a traditional society, undergoing rapid social change. It was a transitional society. And experiencing also the erosion of pre-modern status and pre-modern deference. American society began to embody, or it came to embody these changes to Canadian writers and intellectuals. And as a result, most Canadian writing on America was merely an encrypted commentary on the mass age. Um, English and French Canadian intellectuals shared common preoccupations with respect to the United States, but the tone and the emphasis of their commentary differed. In English Canada, where political institutions and the imperial bond were viewed as fundamental to identity, were viewed as the mainstays of Canadian distinctiveness, writing on the United States tended to deal primarily with diplomatic and political issues. There's a tremendous amount of writing by Canadians on all the things that are wrong about the American political system. In Quebec, where political institutions were not generally viewed as vital elements of national distinctiveness, social and cultural affairs dominated Canadian writing on the United States. Tremendous amount of writing about, you know, American music and boxing and the lack of religion in the United States and so on and so forth. In English Canada, anti-American rhetoric sagged after the Great War, while in Quebec, by contrast, it intensified. And yet, despite its many ups and downs, anti-Americanism has remained present to some extent in Canadian discourse since, really, since the late 18th century. And along with continentalism, it has formed a dialectic which will probably forever color Canadian discourse. Thank you. You've been listening to a recording of Pride and Prejudice, Anti-Americanism Among Canada's Intellectuals, 1891-1945. The talk was delivered by Damien Claude Bélanger of the University of Ottawa as part of the Ottawa Historical Association Lecture Series. You can find recordings of other talks at activehistory.ca.